so this is our first, um, I mean, it's not really our first design school update, but it's our first design school update that we're calling design school update because we've done them in the past. But we're gonna start doing these every other Tuesday because um, so two weeks from now, there'll be another one. And this is because we feel like we need to have a place where we as the sort of hosts of the design school can share what's going on to just maintain the coherence of the complexity of what is going on. And so unfortunately, it's been a little while since we've done a design school, like a, an update of the entire design school. And a lot of things are happening, including we just did this life-changing trip through the Colorado River Basin that is changing. It's still changing the lives of Benji, Penny, and myself. Hopefully it's changing the lives of lots of other people like Eduardo and on and on as we're, as we're weaving these things. But, um, but also we're, um, we're rolling out a series of changes because of two things. One is we're prototyping this whole thing. Like it's just a giant experiment in emergent improvisation. Uh, which is we don't actually know what the right way is to do anything until we're doing it and then continually course correcting with what, what the world is telling us. And we're also gaining a level of complexity that requires new structures to maintain or rather to restore coherence because the process of any living system is it grows in complexity, it goes out of harmony, and it seeks harmony, and this is always happening in any living system. So of course this is happening here too. But um, today what I'm gonna do is take you through what is one of the more difficult talks I've ever had to put together, because I want to make understandable what, what is happening. And I wanna make it understandable without overwhelming you when there's so much happening that it's just downright overwhelming which means I may fail a little bit and I apologize ahead of time. But what I hope will happen is that with this talk, we will have enough clarity that we can then seek the rest of the clarity in our discussion and in the weeks and months beyond. Because um, what you're about to see is that now that we're about four months into this project, we started the design school officially in March, I'd say we've officially completed phase one, which was the phase of having a learning journey and seeming like we're gonna be an online learning community like other online learning communities. Like our main focus might be online courses and webinars and stuff. And then we very, very intentionally broke that to be sure that we don't even accidentally become another one of those. And that we want the design school as much as possible to respond to what's happening on the ground in the different bioregions where different groups are leading their own efforts. Which means all of this is gonna look and feel really different from other online communities. And it's gonna continue changing in ways that I think will stay that way because it's gonna depend on what's happening in Cleveland, what's happening in Toronto, what's happening in Paonia, what's happening in Cascadia, what's happening in Barichara, and then other landscapes as well. And so, um, I really just wanna jump into the presentation because I'm so excited to share with you what's going on. You've probably heard hints of you know, new community level memberships and you may have heard there's some design labs starting to happen and stuff. We've even funded a design lab and haven't told you yet because we haven't had time because it all was happening in the midst of the Colorado River Bay. There's just so much going on. And we don't mean to be incoherent. We're just trying to keep up with it all. And so hopefully today will be like a reset of coherence and an opening to uh, to how you can participate in the emerging coherence in a more more coherent and understandable way. So with that said, let me jump into the into the presentation. So um, here we go. So this presentation, um, we're going to be giving these important updates every two weeks. This is the one for June twenty seventh, twenty twenty three. I want to start by. Um, recounting the story of the design school in brief um, to give us a sense of how we've arrived to where we are and where we're going. And wait, did I just lose everyone? What just happened? Weird. When I went into presentation mode, it said there was only one participant. That was very strange. Okay, thank you, Zoom, for confusing me. Now I'll go back to the presentation. That was fun. All right, so back in October of 2022, that's where I'm gonna start this story. 
we had this really powerful event in Barichara called Ripai Barichara. Penny and I on the last day awoke on the Friday morning, freaked out. Um, oh wait, sorry, I jumped ahead. Uh, I'm gonna tell the story from October, 2022 till about December of 2024, about two years. So back in October, Penny and I both woke up on one Friday morning with this crazy idea that we had to go out into the world and activate bioregions. Like, oh my God, we have to travel and do all this stuff. It's so different. And this bioregional activators idea was born. That's even what we called it. And that took us in early November to the Colorado Rockies where we visited four landscapes, the front range in Denver and Boulder, the uh, central Rockies centered around Rollinsville, and then two watersheds, the Roaring Fork and the North Fork of the Gunnison. And we started to learn how bioregional activations work in practice. Then in January and February, kind of the end of January and the first two weeks of February, we went to the Great Lakes on the invitation of the Legacy Project, Brian and Susan in the greater Takaranto bioregion. And we also went to Ithaca, Binghamton, Cleveland, and Rochester. And so we were refining and improving and learning about what bioregional activations are. And this led us in March to birthing the design school, which we started to articulate in December, but we really officially launched it in, in March, just a few months ago. And since then, we gave a two months, you know, eight weeks of webinars and a learning journey called What is the Design School? So we explored together, what is this design school? How does it work? It's so new that the very first course was, what is it? And we, in this time, we also started forming strategic partnerships with Blue, uh, Blue Dot Project, with Eduardo, with Recommon, with Pro Social World. Um, we're already collaborating with Possible Planet and then others that we're increasingly bringing into our relationships so that we could build the ecosystem that I'm about to share with you. And then we also, what is going on? Um, began preparing for a bioregional activation that's gonna be really big in Cascadia. So we've been making those preparations for a couple of months now. And then we did the Regenerate the Colorado Basin sacred journey and follow up. And this has been happening for the last five or six weeks where now we're working at um, regional or subcontinental scales in the Great Lakes, in Cascadia, and in the Colorado Basin. And so just in the last few months, sort of phase one of the design school was learning what the design school is and setting in motion a pattern of collaboration while also continuing to engage in these large-scale collaborative projects on the ground across networks of landscapes. Here we are in June of 2023, and we're ready to start evolving new structures because we learned a lot during those first three months, and we learned that we needed to create new structures to continue. So one thing that we've done is we've created a community level membership, which I'll talk about in a moment. So we have this design level and community level memberships. We also have begun developing continental regeneration strategies. What we see that we're doing is we're taking the regenerative movement up two levels, up two levels because no one has ever done two things that we're doing in the design school. No one has ever tried to regenerate an entire subcontinental scale process like the Colorado River Basin. Now the uh, Great Green Wall of Africa is an effort that you might say is, is there are living prototypes of similar things. So the case could be made that maybe we're not the only ones doing that. Although it's hard to say how successful they are so far. And we're moving toward the scale of the entire North American continent. So we wanna develop a framework for regenerating continents. And I do think I can, I think I can safely claim that we're the only humans on earth trying to do that. Who else is crazy enough to try to do that? Us, that's pretty much it as far as I can tell so far. Hopefully we'll bring a lot of people onto our bandwagon. We're also moving toward distributive governance. Some of you will recall about two months ago, we talked about how we're preparing the design school fund to move into a participatory kind of governance around governing and distributing those funds. So we're gonna start setting that up in a more formal and explicit way. And we're gonna be doing that work with the design level numbers, which I'll explain a little bit more about in a moment. So those of you who have been patiently waiting, those of you like Grace and Simon and others in our community who know a lot about distributive governance, we really are gonna look forward to working with you on this. So that is coming. 
Also, quietly in the background with people like Eduardo and with others, we have been seeding alliances, partnerships, frameworks, and tools around creating landscape funds. How to bring $100 million to a watershed or a billion dollars to the Colorado Basin or other things on this scale. We have a lot of this kind of larger work slowly and sometimes quickly emerging in the background. And we are prototyping and incubating a variety of design labs and work groups, some of which we've been able to share with all of you and some of which are so new that I'm gonna start sharing them with you today. And we're gonna create a lot more coherence around how they evolve and how they unfold from here moving forward. And so with all of this activity, just in the last couple of months, I wanna maybe shift the timeline for a moment and say, where are we trying to get to by the end of 2024? Where we're trying to get to is we wanna create a community learning ecosystem. We wanna create a community of practice around bioregional scale regeneration with people practicing how they weave projects, set up bioregional learning centers, create funding and governance, deploy the funding and practice governance in their landscapes, while also collaborating at these larger subcontinental scales. So by a year and a half from now, we want a fully functioning community learning ecosystem for bioregional regeneration that can work at continental scales. To get there, we're gonna to have to create some things. And one of those things is we have to create impact funds. So you could talk to Eduardo about some of this. There's also another friend of mine in South Africa named Michael Hopped, another friend of mine named Martin Kirk, and others that I'm talking to, Edward Perello, who works with venture capital funds. We're actually collaborating on multiple fronts with multiple communities around how do we create impact funds for landscape scale regeneration to work across this ecosystem of action. We're also forming deep alliances, which means we're forming the alliances now, but by a year and a half from now, we want them to be deeply co-creative and integrative structures of collaboration between groups like Pro Social World, Common Land Foundation, Blue, uh, Blue Dot Project, and others. We want to have a tapestry of stories that are inspiring, engaging, and inviting people to participate with increasing capacity for clarity and increasing capacity for attracting, mobilizing, deploying resources. And we want to create a world model. What I mean by this is not a computer simulation. What I mean is by this time, a year and a half from now, we want this community, this community learning ecosystem to know how to expand out to a planetary network of bioregions so that we can actually be doing legitimately doing earth regeneration in places like India, Nepal, parts of China, Eastern Europe, all over South America. And the seeds are being laid right now for a lot of those future collaborations. So this is like painting a larger schematic picture of where we see ourselves going as a design school. This is really big, really unprecedented and really complex work. So let's continue. Basically, for those of you who have read my book, what we're doing is living into the design pathway laid out in that book. So if you want to have another, like a deeper dive for those of you who are less familiar into how this timeline makes sense and how we were able to think it through, this was actually a lot of the work that went into this book and a lot of the work during the previous three years of Earth Regenerators. In the, on the platform of Earth Regenerators, where a large diversity of groups taking a large diversity of actions helped us figure out how to manifest these frameworks in practice. And now within the design school, we have been incubating the manifestation of the design pathway. So I wanna really pay, pay tribute and honor the Earth Regenerators community and the importance of everyone I learned from in creating this book. But it's also for those of you who haven't read it yet, if you read the book, you'll get a little bit deeper picture of what we're doing in the design school. So one of the big changes that we're making right now is a concern that has come up multiple times by local organizers within the landscapes is how can they invite community members to join who don't really know what it is we're doing and wouldn't be inclined to pay $50 a month, which was the level of membership when we started. So what we've decided to do is to name the original membership level, the $50 per month or $500 per year, we're calling that the design level. 
And now we've created a new community level, which is $5 a month. It's like the cost of a Starbucks coffee. We think that we should be able to grow a huge community level membership. And so the idea is that there'll be a $5 per month level and a $50 per month level. Or if you wanted the discount annual rate, $50 per year for the community level or $500 per year for the design level. And this is the list of benefits and the table that Penny created for the landing page of the design school. But I wanna walk through it for you in a little bit more detail. And just as a snapshot, as of right now, we have 67 members at the design level and 21 members at the community level. And we've only been inviting people to join at the community level for the last two weeks, which means we're still tiny, right? We're still really small. And uh, we have a lot of healthy growing to do at the right speed. So basically to clarify the difference between the design level and the community level, the design level is for members who are actually organizing the landscapes, who are building the tools and frameworks, who are weaving the tapestries of local projects, who are doing the, the deep design thinking and design learning collaboratively, collaboratively with other design level members. And that means the design level is for those people who really want the deep dive. They wanna participate in governance, they wanna participate in funding, they wanna participate in leading and hosting and organizing. And that means that the design level members can invite and engage community level members. So here the blue represents the, the design level members and the green represents community level members. So what would community members do? Well, they might be members of local communities in these landscapes. So they might be members of the local community in the greater Toronto area or in Cleveland or in Rochester or in Paonia or in Seattle or in Victoria. So where the people are organizing landscapes, you, if you are organizing a landscape, can invite members of your community at the community level. Also, there are just people who are not within one of the landscapes that's being organized in the design school right now, but they just wanna learn more about what we're doing. And they're gonna get access to all of our online learning resources for $5 a month. It's almost like, it's like a nearly free university education. $50 a year for a university education is sort of what they're getting. And then they're just gonna be people who would like to give us $5 a month, who may not show up very much, and they just wanna support the design school. So someone who wants to support the design school can give $5 a month and then get updated through our newsletters and our other check-ins about what's going on. And at any time they could support other things in other ways, like they could contribute to our impact fund or to some of our landscape funds or to a scholarship fund. But simply by being a member at $5 a month, they're supporting the school. So these are three very obvious ways to earn $5 a month. It's worth it for all of this. Like we wanna make it so cheap, it's completely a no brainer for people to be able to join. But we want there to be an investment because of the way the design school fund works and because we only want committed people. We don't wanna be spam, spammed by freeloaders. And so to clarify a little bit how these two levels of membership work, the design level membership, which was the original version of membership for $50 a month, these members get, ex get exclusive rights to this. So the list I'm about to share with you is what community level members don't get to do. The design level members can request a bioregional activation. They can bring the design school to their landscape to activate community dialogues, to give talks and workshops, and to help facilitate the organizing of their landscape. They can lead a design lab in the design lab center. They can lead a course like a thematic dialogue in our live learning center. For example, Grace has been, she led a teach-in on monetary design that was very well attended and everyone loved. And as a design level member, someone can do that. They also can manage one of the spaces. So a design level member can go to Penny who hosts the platform's administration and say, Penny, could I set up a space for this activity? And Penny would say, yes, you can. Or she would say, I recommend you do it over here for more coherence of the platform but the design level members can manage a space for their own projects and they can use and leverage the design school for their own projects. They can also help govern the design school fund, which is the pool of money from our membership dues. So we're gonna create a governance process for the design school fund and the governance is open to design level members. 
Also, design level members can apply for funding from the design school fund, whereas community level members cannot. So these are all things that design level members can do. Community level members for five bucks a month get to do all of the following things, which of course, design level members can access as well. They can access all of our online learnings, our self-guided learning journeys, thematic dialogues, teach-ins, the intro to earth systems that I just gave, other courses offered by design level members. They can access design resources, Many of us in the design school are creating templates, mapping resources, all kinds of resources that are being held and organized within the, the Mighty Networks platform. Community level members can participate in events such as campfires or bioregional updates or design school updates like this one. They get access to all of these community events and they can participate in bioregional activations because they know about them because a design level member of the school might invite and organize one, and then they can get involved by being in the design school. And they can participate in design labs. I say here at the discretion of the host because the design labs have a host or a host team, and each design lab has its own criteria for membership. So design level members can create a design lab and say only the four of us are in this design lab. Or they can say only members of my local community, like a design lab being run in Carbondale, Colorado right now is for the local food shed. Or they could run a design lab that's only for design school members and then all community level members could join. So here, I hope this starts to give you some clarity to why people should join at the $5 level and why eventually some community members will want to become design level members to increase their engagement and participate in these other activities as well. But this gives them an exploratory space that's easy to commit to, to join and start learning and get involved, and then eventually decide whether or not they wanna to go to the design level. So right now, we're a pretty small community. Like I said, there's 67 design members and 21 community members, and the composition looks something like this. In the future, what we imagine is gonna happen is that the entire community is gonna grow, but in, we actually anticipate that there will be fewer design level members and a lot more community level members. Where in the future, there might be 200 design members and 2000 community members. So just recognizing that community level membership is really easy for people to get on, to get involved, to learn what's happening and support the design school and get all kinds of benefits. But we already recognize from these first few months that a lot of people who joined at the design level would probably rather be community members because they don't wanna do the deep work of organizing their landscapes, designing governance, doing fundraising, designing and implementing funds, these are things that design members are doing. And so we anticipate in the future that we'll slowly accumulate design level members and that we'll much more rapidly accumulate community level members. And by having these two kinds of membership, this is very easy to do. And so we imagine that the composition of the design school will change significantly as time goes on. But notice how we're able to protect and create a membrane around the design level membership, which is to say the design level members can create their own private groups that don't just have some random person off the street who paid $5 a month drop in and interrupt their process. They may have a governance process that's already been going for a full year. And so there are very important and very subtle aspects of the design process that need to be protected from newbies who come into the scene. But also newbies need lots of playgrounds and lots of sandboxes they can play in as soon as they arrive. And so this distinction between levels of membership allows for all of that to organically emerge. So right now, almost no one knows about the design school. We're doing this incredible world-changing work with like 87 members. And so the best way to, co to grow the design school's membership in a, coherent mem uh, in a coherent way is for existing members of the design school to make personal referrals to others who they think should be here. We're not worried about growing quickly we want to grow coherently. One of the best ways we have for this to happen is bioregional activations. Mm -hmm. Because when the design school goes and does a bioregional activation, like we're about to do in Cascadia, what happens is lots of people in the community that is being activated will see that they might want to be community level members. 
And then as they get involved, they might tell their friends. And this word of mouth personal referral is the most coherent way that we can think of for the design school to grow. So we do want to grow our community membership, but we wanna grow it with existing relationships and existing trust. And sure, there'll occasionally be someone who finds out about us on LinkedIn or Twitter, but we want the majority of new members to come from existing members. Think of it like building a church. A church grows by someone inviting you to their church, and then you show up and you decide if you wanna be there or not, because there's already a set of community supports in place. We're thinking in that very pro-social way about growing our membership. And so right now, because of the way our bioregional activation processes are working, we could easily recruit members from the Great Lakes because we're organizing at the level of all of the Great Lakes. So right there is 40 million potential community members. The Colorado River Basin, anyone who gets the water from the Colorado River Basin, right there is already an existing pool of 35 million other potential community members. And then Cascadia, which I haven't calculated the number there, what maybe it's 20 million? I need to go and actually do the math on that one. Um, but how many people is it? So if it's 20 million plus 35 plus 40, we've got roughly 75 or 80 million people in our membership pool through word of mouth, just with these regions of the continent. I'm kind of being tongue in cheek, but I hope you see that we can grow this design school in a very coherent way by accumulating capacity within the communities that are organizing themselves as part of the design school. And that this will avoid one of the problems outlined during our learning journey, which was the inability for people to do sense making when you blend online and on the ground. For those of you who haven't seen it, go back to what is the design school? I think it was webinar number five. There was one of them in there where we basically said there's an intractable, intractable problem that a psychopath or a bad actor can come into an online space and destroy sense making because there is not coherent organizing on the ground. For this design school to remain coherent, we need to anchor its online coherence to the natural coherence of on the ground, real world communities and landscapes. And that is our strategy for the long term. And we are embodying that in the way that we're encouraging the recruitment of community level members. Okay, so you can invite members to join for the regions where they live, like I just said. By the way, there are other regions than those three, like the Acadian Northern Forest, which is in, in Western Maine with Roberta Hill, who's a member of the design school. And also um, we've got um, Will, who's in West Texas, working with the Ogallala in the Great Plains, which hasn't been represented in the Bioregional Activation Center yet. The Northern Andes is not in bold on this graphic because we haven't made it visible yet, because that's the work we're doing in Barichara, and we're still anchoring Spanish language into the design school in creative ways. So we're not ready to make that really public and figure out how it works. But the basic idea is that members from the larger world of humanity can join the design school through these community activation processes and then directly get involved in those organizing activities. And so we have some upcoming activation tours. We got a big one in October for Regenerate Cascadia that we've been developing with people like Claire and Brandon and Megan for several months now. We're planning to arrive sometime around September 28th, complete sometime around November 3rd, so about five weeks. Our current vision for the tour is to visit 20 different communities, so it's gonna be huge. And then in January, we're plotting and scheming with Brian and Susan for them to organize a summit and invite us back to the greater Takaranto bioregion in Southern Ontario. Meanwhile, the weaving continues in the Colorado Basin, the Northern Andes and other areas. So there's a lot of dynamic activity that's happening distributed around the world already, which is why we need these design school updates to keep you informed about what's going on. Okay, so one of the big changes that we're making is these community level members. Another big change that we'd already talked about, but that we now have I would say Penny has worked her butt off creating all the support structures for, and several of you as design school members have already started prototyping processes, is that we are now activating the Design Lab Center, which means all of the projects I'm about to name are being led by design level members. One of them is that the design labs have sprung forth into the world, and we already see five of them that are happening. 
Now we haven't named all of them as design labs yet, but we recognize them as a, at a pattern level that these are design labs that are already happening. One is that something initiated within the Cascadia project with learning that we had from the Great Lakes is how to create pre-activation supports for new bioregions. How do we template the process? How do we on-ramp local community organizers? How do we prepare for these big and increasingly sophisticated bioregional activations? We're gonna have a design lab focused on that. We're also gonna have a design lab focused on the development of the design school, its governance, its um, platform, its modes of cooperation, so there's a lot of things happening around how the design school is forming that different members of the design school are already starting to work on. And as we make this lab coherent, other design level members will be able to join it. Also something that's been happening that hasn't been named as an activity of the design school, but is so deeply integrated that it is, is how do we create these collective impact funds? How is it that Eduardo has already been doing this work? But I've been working with Eddie Perella, with Michael Hopped, with several others in doing the same thing, but we're not coherent with each other, which means we need to create a design lab on collective impact funds. The collective impact funds are around bringing $100 million to a bioregion or $500 million or a $1 billion to a, to a region like the Great Lakes or the Colorado Basin. We have to collectively design these processes and build relationships with all of the funding communities to do it. And while that work is happening, it will be a design lab of the design school. And then there's bioregional mapping work that's already happening, being led by Brandon Letzinger of the Cascadia Department of Bioregion. Elliot Groen in, uh, in Caledon in Ontario has been really active there, as have others, like Anna Perpura, who has been hosting the dialogues around bioregional mapping for the Great Lakes. So a bioregional mapping process is so coherently a design lab that it's something that we're naming as a design lab in this new center. And then Gwen from uh, Carbondale, Colorado had requested funding from the Design School Fund. And we have now allocated $1,500 in funding to her to ignite a weaving of projects related to food sovereignty and food security in the Roaring Fork Valley to create a Roaring Fork Food Alliance. And this is connected to their work of birthing a landscape partnership and a bioregional learning center. And it's connected to the Colorado Basin work, which is growing in sophistication on a daily basis right now. So we're launching the Design Lab Center with five design labs. Also, we recognize there are other kinds of work going on that we think are more focused and specific. And so we've decided to name them as work groups because design labs can be multifaceted and more sophisticated and have impacts for the entire design school. Whereas work groups are more focused and specific and have more concrete objectives. Whereas the design labs are figuring out their, their objectives as they go, work groups form around recognizable objectives. And we already see that there are four work groups that are coming into being. One is that we're prototyping a design school advisory council, and then we're gonna invite design level members, some of the design level members of the design school to join an advisory council. And then that will be a work group for being like a steering committee for the design school. There's a grant writing circle, which is a, a group of people who specifically want to apply for grants for their own landscapes. So it's much more uh, specific than collective impact funds, which is about funding ecosystems. There's a focus on digital ecosystems of creating websites and creating other kinds of media communication tools, communication strategies, and organizing supports. And there's the design school funds governance and allocation of funding, which will need a work group. So we're about to have four work groups and five design labs, all of which actually are happening in one form or another right now. And we're gonna build more coherence for them in the coming two or three months so that you'll really be able to understand what each of them is. And of course, there's the Design School Fund. Because there's so much I'm trying to share in this update, I wanna just give a brief overview of the Design School Fund. The Design School Fund is all of the membership dues that we've accumulated so far since March when we birthed the Design School. And so the accumulation of all membership dues has created a total income of $21,600. As of right now, we have spent 6,588 of those dollars 
on operational expenses. That's to pay for the subscription for Mighty Networks, to have a Zoom account, and to pay our core team, which means that Penny, Benji, and I have each received $600 a month for three months, less than subsistence wages. We're basically volunteers to do this work. And so we have been building the design school on an operational budget of $6,500, $6,600 for uh, the last three months. That's definitely below subsistence level. We need to bring in more money than that. Also, we have allocated $5,294 to different projects. We've given $1,500 to Possible Planet as our fiscal sponsor. So they're able to do some of their work with Possible Rochester and the work they're doing in their bioregion. We've given $1,500 to birth a design lab for the Roaring Fork Food Alliance. And we allocated around $2,800, I forget the exact amount, for helping to fund the bioregional activation process for the Colorado Basin. Which means in total, we've spent about $12,000 to build the whole fucking design school. I'm gonna F-bomb that one. Can you believe we've built the whole fucking design school on $12,000? Eat your heart out, impact investors. Who wants to give us a million bucks? Anyway, we still have $9,719 remaining in the fund. And that's why we need to create a governance group for the design school fund to figure out how to work with the future membership dues, the future income, and how to structure this in a transparent and inclusive way to document and update people with live data, all the things that design level members have already requested that we're now ready to start setting up. I just wanted you to get a little brief snapshot of where the design school fund is right now. So as you're looking at all this, it's like, oh my God, there's so much going on, I'm overwhelmed. Okay, wait, you might feel like that. But maybe you feel like this, if you knew where to focus your attention and you knew you didn't have to pay attention to all of it. So I wanted to just suggest some priority activity for all of you as members to know where you might put your attention if you're gonna prioritize some of what's happening in the design school, because there's just so much going on. So one thing is, we have these design school updates every other Tuesday. So there's this one now and then two weeks from now and repeating on a bi-weekly basis. So on Tuesdays, there'll be design school updates. I would encourage you to watch them live or watch the recordings. Also on Thursdays, every other week, we will have bioregional updates where the different bioregions in the design school will share what's happening in their landscapes. Any community member can join these. They are so amazing. We learn so much by just getting little snapshots of what's happening in Toronto, what's happening in Rochester, what's happening in Paonia, what's happening in Vancouver Island. So these bioregional updates happen every other Thursday. And then alternating at the same time every other Thursday are bioregional design sessions. So this Thursday in two days, we'll have a bioregional design session. And what we do in these sessions is we identify common challenges confronted by the different bioregions. And then we attempt to explore and create solutions for them together to solve problems for real world landscapes at the same time. And Every Friday, there are campfires, these social gatherings for weaving people together and getting to know each other. You might notice I cleverly colored these circles yellow, which is a smiley color. And then I made it another smile because I'm a nerd like that. <laughs> because I think you should feel good about participating in these activities. And then whatever else you might feel like participating in. For example, you might like to check out the teach-ins and webinars in the Live Learning Center. I just gave an intro to Earth Systems. There are various theme dialogues, lots of beautiful stuff. Pretty soon we're gonna roll out candlelight talks, which are these inspiring visionary talks about things like collective intelligence and Gaia consciousness and other fun stuff. We'll be rolling those out soon. So you might just check out the Live Learning Center and you might check out what's happening in your bioregion. If you happen to live in one of these regions, Go over there, check it out, and then get involved. So it's just a way of helping you know how to navigate the space and prioritize your time. All right, so how could you help the design school become all that it can be? Well, one thing you can do is just get involved where you feel the most engaged. Feel into your passion and go there. And then ignore the other stuff if it's too much. If you're really interested in bioregional mapping, go there. If you want to get involved in governance of the design school fund, go there. 
If you want to get involved in bioregional activations in Cascadia, go there. So you can help the design school by just getting involved, learning and doing with real world landscapes or with whichever part of the design school speaks to your heart. Second thing is you can help spread the word to invite new members. Now, you know, at $5 a month, we'd need 20 members to bring in $100 a month. So if we're gonna think of this financially, we'd actually need to recruit a lot of members. You can think that way if you want, but I'm actually thinking of something else, which is if you're already organizing in a landscape, or if you're already thematically working on things we're doing here, bring people in and get them involved because much more than the money they bring in, which is minuscule, is the social capital of those relationships and knowledge and what we can co-create together within this ecosystem with your friends getting involved. So please help spread the word to invite new members. You can also contribute ideas and materials on the platform. The best place to do that is to go to the member lounge or to your bioregion if you are within one of them. Just go there into the feed. You'll see there's a feed and you can post links to videos, to articles. You can write commentaries. You can post videos of your own ideas. Go there and contribute ideas and materials to the platform in their appropriate place. If you don't know where to put them and you have an idea, reach out to Penny because she's continually updating the platform and will help you find your way. Also, we've started daily check-ins where Penny, Benji, and I give about a two minute little update so you can watch daily check-ins just to stay informed about what's going on. So that's a, that's your excuse to come onto the platform or just your ability to coherently know what's going on with little daily morsels. So you can help hold the coherence of the field by keeping yourself informed about, about what's going on. And then if you do live in a landscape that's organizing within the design school, join local efforts when you can. Or if your local landscape is not part of the design school, cultivate those relationships and bring the design school to help you. So join local uh, efforts within or not within the design school. That's gonna help what the design school is trying to do. And then give feedback to Penny, Benji, and me about how we're doing. You can give feedback in comments below our check-ins. You can send us private messages. You can join us during the Q&A and the discussions of sessions like this one, like I'm about to ask for your feedback on what I just shared. And so these are the various ways that you can help the design school right now. So that is my presentation. And I'd love to talk with you all about it. So as you can see, it's sort of like, is all of this really happening? And the answer is, I didn't even tell you all of it <laughs> because it's too much. We're just trying to create coherent patterns of development for what's happening. So I just talked a whole bunch. What I think might be nice is if we give ourselves a little moment of a bodily check-in, let's just ground ourselves and hold the sense of what is emerging here. So just calm yourself. Settle and take a nice deep breath. The earth is organizing her humans. Maybe another deep breath. I am part of making this happen. You are part of making this happen. This is really happening. Um, so, are there any questions? Anything that wasn't clear? Anything you'd like to know more about? Comments. Or are there any comments? <laughs> and if you're still just dating and thinking of ideas, I could invite Penny and Benji if they'd like to share any additional thoughts while it's all germinating inside of you. Penny or Benji, is there anything you'd like to share? I'm kind of wanting Benji to share a little about the Colorado Basin stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Benji, you want to share a little bit about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, here I am. I guess I'm sharing. <laughs> uh, um, Not to yeah, put you on the spot, but I put you on the... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the, the button that you pressed called the spotlight? Yeah, it's called the spotlight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I feel put on the spotlight. <laughs> um, yeah, what is it? I mean, there's just so much happening. It's, it's really... Um, it's been really coherent. It, it, it's, it's, 
we've been organizing just very recently. Um, well, uh, let me start over. We've learned a lot from Anna and Jonathan and Victoria and Brian and Susan uh, about the the value of organizing at these really, really big scales, these continental scale or subcontinental scales. Um, it just allows us to, to step into a much bigger story and a much bigger scale, bringing so much more coherence to how we can interrelate as neighboring bioregions. Uh, and this is just becoming more and more a part of, of what we're focusing on in the design school. I hosted a, a session on Sunday inviting folks from across the Colorado River Basin, community leaders that we've met through the, uh, the couple of bioregional activations that we've done, the one in November and then this last Colorado River trip. And so these are people who are sort of self-selecting into this, right? Because they're they're people who are organizing the local bioregional activations as we as we come through town, as we uh, cross crisscross these landscapes. Um, and by bringing them together, you're just bringing together such a high capacity group of people who who are looking for support, who are constantly struggling when it comes to to resourcing, who are oftentimes as as you know Claire has said over and over and over. Like these bioregional weavers are so often forgotten. These people who are trying to weave together processes of regeneration in their places, it's like an invisible role. And we met together with like, what, 12 or 14 of them on Sunday. And just to have them all in the same room um, was just a transformative moment, I felt like, for, for me to, to facilitate that space and just to see the coherence when they started to share stories around what's happening. And we started to see this, this subcontinental scale <laughs> strategy, bioregional learning strategy that was really coherent, take shape, and it was just so energizing. And uh, I'm very excited to see where it goes from here. Um, so I just wanted to bring in that, like that emphasis on that scale. And, and it's really, it maps beautifully to earth system science as well. That's another thing that that um, we haven't talked about quite as much, but Joe gave a webinar last Saturday on earth system science. And the more we can see that together and how a big part of what we're doing when we're trying to regenerate the earth is, is understanding the, the multiple scales of reality that we find ourselves within, seeing the earth systems and the variety of ways that they interplay, uh, and then understanding how we can map ourselves as groups of people stewarding our landscapes onto those systems. So that's yet another benefit of organizing at the subcontinental scale. So there's two big ones. I don't know, have I, have I rambled enough? I think you rambled. You waxed eloquent. How about that? All right. All right. Cool. That's very right. kind. Then, I um, Penny said she had something she wanted to share. So I would just add one thing that wasn't in the presentation today because there was so much. Um, but just adding in that I'm going to be opening this space, which we've talked about before for, I'm not exactly sure what I'll name it, but for the inner work, the inner side of this, the the healing side of this, the trauma work side of this, how do we actually, what are the capacities we, we need to um, cultivate in ourselves to actually be able to do this at the scales that we need to do this, the levels of cooperation that we need to do this at. And um, yeah, so that's coming soon and I'm actually getting pretty clear about that. That'll be probably within the next couple of weeks that I'll open a space in the culture center for this, um, for this kind of work that we can do together. That's it. So yeah, like I said, if I tried to communicate everything that's happening, I would I would just, the story would get too confusing and it might already be pretty confusing. I hope it's not. But um, yeah, are there any other questions or any comments? And use maybe use the hand raising feature or just raise your hand if I can see you. Is there anything you'd like to share? Maddie, please. Yeah, I'm just super stoked. I feel like I've been working towards being ready to activate in something like this for my whole life. Um, and really, I mean, it seems like it's already popping and the air regional, I already know there's a lot happening in my local community. So I'm really excited to plug in. If you guys are not connected into what's happening here in Boulder, there's so much happening and to connect it into all of that. And I've got friends in Paonia and just am super excited to plug in and help activate all that's happening and everything, all the projects I've got in my life and figure out how to weave them and interconnect into them. And also how I was even brought into this was like 
two weeks ago, like a friend of mine from college and University of Iowa randomly just hit me up and started like talking about crypto and stuff. And he's like, you need to hit up Joe Brewer. And it was just like, oh, wow. OK, so a lot of just magic and synchronicity brought me here and really excited to dive in and support. Well, we're super excited you're here. Um, and I can I can already guess we have several friends in common. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, also, the Bloom Network is definitely an organization you should tap into, and I can facilitate the connection. Awesome. Is there anyone else who would like to share? I just want to say the Bloom Network, um, Will Masters, is very connected into that and keeps raising it. Awesome. I mean, it's okay. You don't need to add comments or ask questions. It's okay. <laughs> well, I, oh, I, hang on a second, Eduardo. I just started to open my mouth. Um, all I wanted to say, Joe, was it seems coherent and clearly communicated and, you know, keep opening the fire hose from my perspective. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Stephen. Eduardo. Yeah, I just want to say, I mean, I want to share my perspective on the experience of the activation on particularly the part of the journey of the Colorado River where I was present with the galley. And I see a unique, I want to share a unique set of conditions that appear to be present that are accelerating the activation in Mexicali. And that is, I thought I made a mistake of hiring Benedo last year for another company that was going to open over there and to introduce amazing. some He's amazing. water saving technology, right? And the thing is, uh, it's being a flop because nobody's buying them thing anyway. So like, so what do we do now? <laughs> so oh, I have a resource there. Joe is coming. Let's have Benedo organize the whole thing. <laughs> and to my surprise, well, not to my surprise, it was like, to just tell you a little history. The profile of this person. This is someone that was in charge of a um, vinculación. It's called in Spanish in in the one of the best universities in Baja. Vinculación is a person that is tying academy with industry. Okay, and uh, so in one single guy, we had someone who knows people from government, people from industry, people from academy, and people from the field, from, from uh, agriculture, because some of the projects were done in the field. And so this mega connector seemed like a key piece to um, bring everything together. And I'm thinking if, if this should go into even part of the criteria to look for certain type of profile and talent to bring into the activation process. Uh, and I'm thinking this uh, external or vinculate, uh, I don't know how to say in English, vinculation. Um, yeah, the people in the university who are in charge of linking university with industry so that students can go and practice in the industry. This, Seems to be a really good, well-connected uh, network, networked people. They also have obviously relationships with the owners of such industries, right? So I thought it, it, it was a nice pattern that uh, I've been reflecting on. And after you left, Joe, after you guys left, uh, Benji and Penny, as well, things have been moving. Things have been moving and. They're organizing trips to see each other's projects. They're already uh, discussing alliances. They're identifying which ones are the most advanced projects to actually receive funding um, and building uh, you know, re a really, really strong network. I'm really happy <laughs> about the output of that mistake I did last year. But uh, just, yeah, I just want to share that. Yeah, thank you, Eduardo. One thing I will just add really quickly is that from our perspective as the travelers, to like go through the United States where everyone is like, we can't do anything, it's too expensive, the zoning laws are so difficult, and blah, blah, blah. And we go to Mexico and we're like, 
we're basically the mob bosses of the town and we got the money, so let's just do this shit. <laughs> It was like, my God, Mexicali was like so on it. So, you know, just how how paradoxical and how significant the cultural dynamics are. You know, like, this is like, there's something really incredible about the juxtaposition of those things. And then for an outsider who's just like, wow, this culture feels so different because where I just was, I mean, we met amazing people doing amazing things everywhere. But the pace of Mexicali, because because the institutions are so broken, it's what I see in Colombia too. The formal institutions are so broken, everyone's so good at working around them and there's such a strong social tapestry of like just deep trust relationships. People can get stuff done. It's incredible. So anyway, just total like, you know, respect for Mexicali. <laughs> All right, Claire, on to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah actually, um, my comment fits um, follows well on yours, Eduardo, about all of the different, um, uh, the potential of all of the different levels coming together and working together. And um, I just came back from um, a, an amazing trip to South Africa, but finished with um, the International System Sciences, Society of System Sciences Conference. And um, so Margaret Mead is sort of one of the earlier people and lots of really amazing people have been part of that. But one of the presentations, they had a very strong focus on Southern Africa with um, people working there. And um, in Venda University, which was close by where we were, there was this, um, this black prof woman who um, her role was in community engagement with the projects they were doing. And she was describing the situation where they were supposed to be working with the local community, engaging them in the research. And the research criteria was such that they would build up relationship and trust. And then the criteria would basically not mesh with that break, like be actually actively breaking down the trust with the community. And she said she couldn't continue with any integrity to bring that kind of way of working. Anyway, she, she kept describing what they were trying to do and how the academic process was actually breaking that down and that they needed to be better learning about the land um, that could actually be integrated. So anyway, as she continued on and was describing everything that bi-regional learning centers, the ecoversities do, I went to her afterwards. So she that's what they, she was saying we, they needed more of. And um, there was not a whole lot of response from the, the audience who are all involved in setting up these kinds of learning um, universities um, using. So I spoke to her afterwards and said, you know, that's exactly what, what we do is what you were asking for and can support that kind of learning. And like, I know there's an amazing opportunity to work there, but it really did strike me that, wow, in a room where surely that would have been stuff that they were wanting to address, they just, um, it, it didn't seem like it was the people were even thinking about what we're doing here. So just to say, I love hearing these updates. I just love as we grow and increase our capacity to do this because this is work that's needed. Um, so yeah, feeling so, ex just super excited seeing the connection of what, what we're doing and how completely apt it is. And that came into to so many conversations I had down there, so yeah. Quick question, where was that woman located or where does she do her work? She's in, um, uh, well, she's just outside the Kruger Park area, so in Northern Trans uh, Gauteng. Is that close? I, I don't know the geography very well. Is that close to Cape Town or is that far away from there? Oh, it's um, north of uh, Johannesburg, Pretoria. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just to say, there were government officials there um, who, and because my family has a deep history there, there was sort of this connecting of dots of the people that they worked with. They, um, uh, yeah, there were just so many connections where the month, there is quite a bit of money to support that work. It's just the way it's being integrated is just not great. And so, um, anyway, I see lots of opportunity to, to, because those are 
incredible indigenous systems that are actually community-based, intact, intergenerational. Um, and yet the systems of support are not there. And so. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I'm thinking that I need to introduce you to Michael Hopt, who yeah. advises wealth managers and is doing his own bioregional scale project just north of Cape Town. And he's from South Africa. So anyway, just another one more of many threads that will be woven. Um, so uh, maybe we'll just close today by saying that um, I hope that if it wasn't clear before that we're actually serious about doing this. I, I hope that's just very, very clear that we're actually very serious about doing this. We're serious about creating billion dollar funds. We're serious about weaving communities and landscapes at large scales. You know, we're serious, we're serious, we're serious about doing this. And um, and I, I think that as more people figure out what we're doing, when they actually understand a little of it, it's gonna open so many doorways because of the way that we're quietly weaving collaborations in the background. So just as an example, tomorrow I'm gonna to speak with Bill Bowie of R3.0 and Ben Roberts of Regenerative Communities Network and a few other things. And basically they're collaborating to do a follow-up to this R3.0 report on funding and governance for systems transformation, which highlighted the Barichara Regeneration Fund and Regen Foundation and several other things. And I'm gonna to talk to them just to say, hey, let's get on the same page so that we can all weave together. And um, I'm quietly doing this with everyone that actually knows how to collaborate. And those who don't know how to collaborate, I'm just like letting them die in the dust basically um, because there's just no time. And so if you had heard the conversation I had this morning with Pro-Social World's Latin American contingent with Shift the Power, which started in Joburg and with uh, what's about to happen in Barichara, there's just social movements and social movements and social movements all just like doing this right now. They're just doing it. And our job is to be in integrity in ourselves and let the waves wash and ride the surf just, you know, whenever it comes. So to say that there's there's a really, really deep weaving happening right now. Um, and it's happening. We have our own little pieces of it. It's, it's huge because so many people are doing it. So I just want to name that. Uh, and then I see Mitty put her hand up. So Mitty, welcome. Well, I, I just put my hand up to join a couple of dots, Joe, to say that I'm part of the co-creating Fundo ecosystems with Ben. Um, so just so that you know, that connection is already made. Yeah, actually, I, I did know that because it's sort of like how the Edgewalker Prize was doing its thing. And then this other project with Ben was doing its thing. R3.0 has been doing its thing for 15 years. They're, they're a power network that you can't even imagine how many people they know and how much weaving has occurred throughout that whole time. Uh, so it's just to say there's about to be a lot more that becomes visible. I talked to a friend yesterday that I worked with at the rules for, for more than five years. And he said that he's with the Novo Foundation that has directly funded 200 different indigenous groups, which means the foundation has trusting relationships with 200 indigenous groups all over the world. So I don't have to have any of those relationships, they do. It's like we're we're weaving the weave at this point, it's happening at this scale. And so, um, so just to say that the coherence of what we're doing is the coherence of landscapes, which is what Benji was naming. These are nested levels of reality. And because it's reality, we can actually coherently work with it over time. And that's what's making all of this so happen so organically and so naturally. So the breakdown is far enough along that it's time. And um, that the learning capacity about how to do this is mature enough and the natural organizing patterns are there. And so um, thank you everyone and onward we go. I just feel so honored to be here with all of you. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next and what a fun game <laughs> that we're playing here. So thank you very much, everyone. I'll make the recording available this afternoon as soon as it uploads. And um, so you can watch it again whenever you like. And please do invite your friends to join the design school. Now that you see there's an easy way to get involved, 
um, let's let's pull our friends in so we can all play in the same sandboxes. I think that'll make all this a lot easier. And bring our sandboxes to other people's sandboxes to just big build bigger sand piles. <laughs> um, so yeah, and on and on. That metaphor is probably exhausted, so I'll stop there. Um, but thank you, everyone. And onward, fellow humans. Thank <laughs> you.